All right, welcome to Judoka Talk, where Judoka Talk. Today we got two, two great brothers here. We got Shadi and Mohab Elnahas from Canada. Hello. And we got the regulars. We got Kyle and Liam Wright, two other brothers. And we got Jesse Butler and Geronimo Saucedo. Saucedo. They are not brothers. <laughs> anyway, you guys want to say hi? Brothers in blood. I don't know if that works. But anyway, <laughs> so obviously I want to start off just, uh, you know, today we're just asking you guys, you know, Shadi and Mohab, how the uh, pandemics affected you guys over in Canada and how that affected your training and and how things are getting back to normal. I mean, I usually start because I'm the older, but I'll, I'll let you start because I'm nicer too. Thank you. Well, we, at first we did no training. It was always on Zoom call. We do team trainings. So it'd be really short, really quick. And then when things started getting better, we started traveling to Alberta. So Alberta, we had to travel to Alberta because the, the pandemic was less bad because in Montreal and Toronto was really bad, so we couldn't train there. So we'd go for like three weeks, four weeks uh, to Lethbridge, Alberta, and we trained there, just the Olympic team. But now things are just starting to open up. So we're starting to do a groups of four at a time to train. So you guys yeah, are well, based in Montreal, right? Yeah. Well, also, what I wanted to say is uh, in the beginning of the quarantine, like I think it was in March, it started really bad because obviously like for the first couple of weeks, we had nothing to do, like the big change where you, we, your body's used to train every day and we just had to like shut down completely. We're like kind of in shock. But then we start going for runs. We start doing like independent trainings like, like by ourselves. And I feel that still in like in a positive way, it made me, feel like uh, more uh, independent when it comes to training too. And like, I don't need like the coaches as much or like the group and stuff. And I feel like uh, it was kind of a blessing in the beginning. And uh, the fact that I was able to train by myself and don't need like as much uh, people and stuff. And of course it's not the same when you do judo, you need your buddies and, and the partners, but I started like doing more runs. I started doing more uh, body weight training and it was just, I was able to, uh, to manage, you know, and it was good. But yeah. also, no, I feel for, like, you guys and us guys, too. I feel like me and Mob started off by me and him just training alone. I feel like you guys, especially you, John, because you're a big boy, yeah. we don't have, and uh, Geronimo, we don't have that many bodies. Hey, what about me? I'm a big boy, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're used to training with limited amount of people, right? right. So yeah. I feel like we kind of manage to be able to train somehow with the amount of bodies we have, you know? And you and your brother... Liam and Kyle, mm -hmm. you guys train alone often, right? So I think we're kind of used to training, doing that more common than not, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but you guys still have quite a few people uh, on the Canadian team, at least around our way. Yeah, uh, for Mohab, it's, uh, it's better. There's a few 90s. Yeah, for me, it's a little bit rougher, even though they're 90s. I think I need... Yeah, you don't have too many uh, big guys. Yeah, or like lefties, and lefties are my kryptonite. I mean, for me, it's perfect, because yeah. like, I'm a light 90, and in, in Canada, we have heavy 73s, we have heavy 81s, and we have 90s. And I sometimes go with 100, like Shadi, because uh, I'm stronger than him. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's like I literally fight everybody, and it's okay. I don't go with the extremes, obviously, like 66, 60. It's not like, a, it's not a fair fight. But uh, yeah, like I fight a lot with even the 73s, like Arthur Bouchard, and they give me a good fight. And it's, uh, I'm able to like train well. But right now, obviously, we can't do that. We only have a group of four, like Shadi said. But last month when we were in Alberta, we, we were the, the Olympic team, the whole Olympic team was training together. So that was pretty cool. So the whole, so you're saying the whole team kind of moved from Montreal to Alberta? Yeah. They, you guys they, didn't decide to like have a bubble instead? You decided just everyone moves away? So the thing is like it was illegal to do judo in Montreal. The only place that was legal was in Alberta for some reason. I don't even know why. But so, so judo Canada decided to make the Olympic team tra travel there. I think we were like eight, eight people, around the eight people. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so it was legal to just train there, you know, like the, the eight people. I guess maybe like there was a rule less than 10 people. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. But we did randoids all together. It was cool. But now that we're back in Montreal, the new rule that just started a couple of weeks ago is a group of four. So now we're training only with four partners, which is not as good as it was in Alberta, I would say. But 
we're dealing with what we with what we can right now. And how far away is Alberta from Montreal? Just to five, five hours, and a half hour flight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so that's right. Yeah, horrible wow. compared to the traveling we're used to doing. Yeah. Yeah. But honestly, I don't know. It felt like a, I'm going to Europe because like five hours is still like like Europe. What from Montreal seven. to Europe is like six, seven. It's seven. almost the same. So we're used to it. But at the same time, I'd rather go to Europe. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, so, um. So usually, how's like training like? Because I imagine people are interested in like what training is like in different countries and different centers. And I don't know if you've like trained up. I mean, you've been to training camps at least, and you can like kind of feel out how people would do randori in other countries. But I don't know if you mm -hmm. trained in any other national centers in any other country. But yeah, to be honest, I love uh, traveling to Europe, especially those countries like those. Uh... Western European, like, uh, remember when we were in Papendal all together, all of us? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun. To me, like, training doesn't change as much because, like, I go for randoris. I don't go to, like, learn technique or anything when I travel. So I go to fight people, right? And, I, and like, like, everybody knows here, each country has kind of their own style of judo. So, like, let's say, like, the, the Russians, they're more, like, physical or the Georgian. Let's talk more about the Georgian. They just, like, do, like, a lot of uranagis, like, the lifting techniques. Then you go to Japan or in Tokyo, it's more, like, sleeve lapel like just like really fast techniques and like not as much power so i just love to travel all around wherever i can so i can just get as much experience and i feel that's what builds your judo as much also i feel like again i'll speak for all of us i feel like us like the american team and the canadian team we don't have a specific style because we're all coming from different spots like i think john jane for example he doesn't have a specific he has a john jane style <laughs> has his own style you have Liam you have your own style everybody's their own style so I feel like it's uh, it's like a mixture of all all styles combined into one and that makes you like have your own unique style it might change a lot eh? you change every two days yeah. like no <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice yeah you went you went from Uchimara to Sumigeshi Mohab <laughs> yeah, that's like, now now I'm doing COEs I'm, too, I'm switching <laughs> You know, got, I don't know, every competition, um, Mohab comes to me. He's like, I got a new technique. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> let, me, let me try it in the competition. In like, 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 from literally from Paris to Dusseldorf, it, the technique he was planning to do was different. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember that. This Karagaruma phase was, was, was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. But the funny thing, like at the Pan Am Games, I literally switched, like it was during the same tournament. I switched styles. <laughs> and for the bronze medal, the guy was like, what the hell is he doing? And I, and I ended up winning, right? So I was like, surprise, buddy. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it works sometimes. But it's I good to have, like, a, you have like, a special technique, but then you can add some, like, you know, secret weapons. No, I definitely like the idea of, like, being able to fight a lot of different styles. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I, the one time I tried, I've tried fighting right-handed in competitions just to, like, throw people off. And like it works until I get really tired, but cause <laughs> if you, I don't know, but if you fight the wrong side for like more than three minutes, you, yeah, you're gonna die. It's it's so it's a lot harder. Yeah, because you're constantly like thinking about you have to think about what you're doing. You're not just like working off instinct. And that, yeah, you lose concentration pretty quickly, and you also don't have a lot of like you know historical background in winning matches in your wrong side. So you don't have as much confidence when you're fighting in a style you're not used to. Yeah. But more on what I was uh, asking was more like, what, so let's say what's your like weekly schedule at the moment and what's your weekly schedule if there is actually competitions coming up? So basically we train twice a day every day. In the morning is usually we do three to four times a week weights and then one to two times a week in the morning uh, technical. So it varies, right? And at night, it's always we're doing drills and uh, randories. So we fight every night. And that's pretty much been it, too. Like, we've, we haven't changed the way we do it. It's just the amount of people and uh, the amount of time we have is different. So basically, we always start at night. Uh, we do some technical, of course, like drills. Then we do niwaza. Then after niwaza, we do standing technical uh, drills, technical, and then we do fighting. And that's pretty much been like how we do it. So that's pretty cool. And then at the gym, we just try to focus on strength right now. Yeah. So, yeah. What kind of lifting do you guys focus on mainly? So we mostly do like the, the, the major movement like for the body compound. So we do like deadlifts, bench press, squats, cleans, 
I think those are the, the, the main mm-hmm. things for judo. Like more explosive, more power these days. Like I think that's the program. Yeah, so it's, it's basically the, 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 the most main, the main body movement that, yeah. that help in judo, right? Well, how about mm-hmm. you guys in the U.S. right now? Like what are you doing? I don't even know. I mean, everybody's doing their own thing. Yeah, yeah but so you're still able to train. You were able to find a gym, or sort of, yeah. Yeah. So, so we have a we have a home like a garage yeah. gym right now. <laughs> I think uh, John's the videos on Instagram they're really they're really nice and dope. I like it. But I was wondering if everybody like has their own thing where you guys go uh, to uh, club to John to his uh, crib. John is in London. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I'm just stuck in London. So, and there's, um, we're talking about having a second lockdown here. So, I actually like ordered uh, like a squat rack, a pretty cheap one for 150 pounds, awesome. and then some like rubber flooring, like some crash, like some like crash pads to drop weights on. Because like when I do clean and presses, if I drop them, I want to drop them on something that yeah. doesn't break the floor. Yeah, and I'm like ordered a bar, and I'm like ordered some plates, and I'll probably get more plates. And I'm thinking of getting some like specialty bars like log press and like trap bar and like Swiss bar, just to, like have more stuff than the actual gym. So yeah. that's cool. But like I'll just like uh, as time goes on, I'll probably get more stuff. But like I've for here, judo is not a thing. No. Like there's some BJJ clubs that are running on running illegally at the moment. Um or they're like having like if you're like live in the same household you can like go to the club and train but judo is completely not happening only the national center is going and i don't think they're gonna i one i don't want to go live in Walsall. like i'm about to start my master's like and yeah. so i don't Walsall is like three or four hour drive away from me and also i don't want to live in Walsall. yeah mm-hmm. oh do what works for you right yeah like if um and i so i don't think training is really going to start up again here until <clears throat> until a vaccine comes out yeah so you'll just see me training for like maximal strength for a good like couple more couple more months probably i think i might go back to deadlifting and see if i can get to like 300 kilo deadlift john you haven't practiced judo at all since march i've done some like uchikami but even then i stopped doing that for a while because my knee was not not happy with it yeah. Yeah. what do you what do you think your personal uh, opinion about the competition starting do you think they're gonna wait till there's a vaccine because like you know tokyo was supposed to be on yeah so but, they canceled tokyo and yeah it's like the same remember in the beginning of uh the virus, like they, they still like said, uh, Ekaterinburg is on, everything is on, and every time two weeks before they just cancel it. And I feel they're doing the exact same thing right now. It's like always they're just saying that to like give hope, but then they, it, it's kind of like I feel like they know already it's not gonna happen, but they just say like you know like we'll make people like motivated, and then like two weeks after it's like ah oh, never mind. So yeah, I don't know if so, you're gonna wait till there's a vaccine or what's up, but what do you guys think? So. When I first saw that the IGF was going to start competitions again, I was like, it's just for hope because yeah, it's, that's not, exactly. it's, it's not possible right now. Like, yeah, even with all the um, precautions, like the whole, the whole yeah. Pr- yeah, the precautions they put in, it's yeah. ha- have you read those? It's not, it's not possible to do all those, yeah, like, no, to the, clean the, the mats the, after yeah, every the grand flight, and stuff for the competition. We were like at least 600 people or something, mm-hmm. like maybe not at least, but like we were around 500 people every tournament, and you know, like how like. It's like different, like more than 50 countries and like it's just huge. It's a big, uh, it's a big set. It can be, uh, can be just taking it easy like that. No. Uh, how did you feel like knowing that the Olympics were postponed, knowing that you're already qualified? Like that really annoyed me because I'm ranked in the top eight. So I was like really frustrating because also I have a Canadian like teammate and now like there's more time for him to like climb back up and that kind of sucks for me but at the same time I just gotta try to keep it like mentally strong and also because maybe that was a blessing in disguise because I've ha- I've been having trouble with like a few hundreds like Wolf, Adam Yan so I think it'll give me like I got a lot stronger since. You did? Yeah so. I used, I used to throw him 10 times now I throw him maybe four or five. <laughs> 
You want yeah, one, one, one Mohab's only thrown you once, then you're gonna run. You're you you know hundreds won't know what hit them. <laughs> yeah, like, I was, I've, I've been getting a lot stronger, so maybe that's a blessing in disguise. But uh, like I was I was wanting to say, it's like I feel like the IGF is just trying to make up for the money they lost during this time. So they're trying to rush competitions, but at the same time, they're not gonna put every athlete and their own risk, yeah, mm-hmm. their health at risk, you know. So, so, it's so what do you guys think is money? All the money is they the, lost. Yeah, is the Canadian team like expecting or like thinking about ramping up to like even go to for Budapest or maybe well, the Masters in January or something? Yeah. Well, it might like so. Here's what happened: the moment uh, like the news came up that those tournaments are up. Of course, like our coach, main coach came up to us, like, guys, you got to get ready, blah, blah, blah. But that's what I'm saying. I think it's just like, it's motivation, but like in the back of their head, they know like it's not going to happen because like everybody heard the rumors, Europe is closing down in a week. And like, you just like, uh, you confirmed that, right? Like you said, like probably the, you guys are having another lockdown and I think they're going to do the same thing here in uh, Montreal and Toronto. So I think literally they're just like, uh, they're just like giving us hope, which is which is good because like imagine we didn't have any like highs of the emotions or like oh we don't know when the competition came since like any competition coming up since March, I think we would be in a different mindset. But the fact they're like oh my god like we're about to we're about to get us excited and we train hard for like a couple of weeks and then they shut it down, then we get disappointed. But I feel like it's still it's still good for us in a way even though like we're getting played. But like I know that for sure soon enough they're going to figure out something so we don't know when when is going to be the time where they're going to be like tournament is in february like let's say paris like i have hope paris is going to be the first thing you know because uh like from paris to the olympic the summer olympics it's only a couple months you know so they gotta like find something and i think you guys don't think that budapest is going to happen no i don't think Budapest is gonna happen. yeah nothing december yeah. Sure. yeah i kind of learned i'm like i'm not gonna have like I think our our coaches are just making us stay ready just in case like they're like oh damn it's actually happening throw you on the plane last minute yeah literally so we're just staying staying ready in some sort of way as much as we can but for me after I knew the Olympics were postponed I was like okay there's no way we're gonna have any competitions this year so yeah for me I'm like I'm not expecting anything positive or negative i'm just neutral about it if it happens it happens if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen damn what a tough guy to have there sorry it's probably the best mindset to have just yeah be neutral and i don't want to be too excited and oh my god i'm gonna fight i don't want to be too sad like oh damn nothing's gonna happen yeah you know? not not yeah. like mohab going up and down yeah that's me i've been going up and down you know i gotta be more grounded more chill and nothing too much Hey, Shadi, you said there was another hun- another hundred for Canada that was sneaking up. Is that right? Yeah, uh, Kyle Reyes, yeah. Yeah, he's in Japan right now. So. He must be kind of annoyed that Tokyo got cancelled. But... Yeah, I don't know. I, th- I thought it was like the perfect scenario, you know, like to- like Olympics in Tokyo, blah, blah, blah. It's like a fairy tale story. It's just too, but, good. It's too good for Judah. Yeah, it was too good to be true, you know, so... <laughs> But it might okay. still happen. We'll see. I mean, Paris is a pretty, like, for Diamonds, like, another four years away. Paris is a pretty good place for Judo to have Olympics. I, at first, I was like, oh, oh, I'm so sick of going to Paris, blah, blah. But <laughs> thinking about it, it's, it's, the, the Judo is insane there. So To me, Paris is going to be even better than Tokyo, to be honest. Well, yeah, the, the, fan, the fans are a lot louder and more exciting and I speak French so I'll understand what people are saying and stuff mm-hmm. yeah. So <laughs> yeah Mohab just likes to know when they're talking about him I know I thought it was going to be pretty cool when I fought um Clergé in Paris that was, that was a really good fight yeah because yeah, mm-hmm. I was center Matt as well so like everyone was watching me I thought it was pretty cool and I still remember uh, one time he was like doing the Uchimata to me and I was like Oh, I think he got me here. Like, I'm going, I'm going. Then I hear the crowd, like, screaming. And I was like, oh, I'm not getting thrown like this. <laughs> like, I'm not getting thrown in front of 10,000 people. <laughs> Does it, like, affect you? Of course. Does um, it affect you if the crowd was, like, literally 99.9 of the crowd, except your teammates and me and Mob were against you? Um, That motivated me more, yeah. I think. The only time where, like... I've had a crowd be against me and it like really um, 
got in my head was when I was, um, this was juniors, like 2015. I was fighting uh, Dominic Schoenfeld in Germany. And this was in Poland. So there's a lot of Germans in the crowd. And like anytime I did it, I was like leading and like anytime I did a drop, like the entire crowd would start like making cheer, like jeers and booing. And that like really got in my head. And so like I ended up losing that because I just couldn't focus. Because yeah. I was like so worried about if I was going to yeah. drop, I'd get a penalty. Yeah, that sucks. What about you boys? What do you think? It's like, do you guys think the crowd affects you in some type of way? Or do you guys learn to like shut it all out? So when I when I when I fight, oh go ahead. Oh, uh, I said it's it's exciting because, I mean, for me, this last Paris Grand Slam was my first one. So when, like, when you come out and you, I, I think Paris is probably I haven't been to Tokyo or Osaka, but I think from what I've heard, Paris is like a lot louder, a lot bigger, and if you can feel it a lot more. And when I came out, it just it just felt exciting, you know, being able to just walk out and be in the situation that I was in. Jesse, had a hard fight. Jesse you've done fight to win. What are the crowds like at fight to win? Obnoxious and rude. So, like, <laughs> you have people, uh, so like you have the ring and then you have the people that paid uh, like a lot of money to get the tables. So what they'll do is they'll stand up on the mat because the mat is like right here to them. They'll stand up on the mat And uh, if you're about to throw somebody or if you're about to, like, choke or armbar somebody, they'll start hitting the mat like that. And that kind of throws off your focus. And the whole time they're yelling and cussing and stuff like that. And it feels like you're in the middle of a, of a gladiator pit. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> That's think, epic. You know, it's real. It is cool, but it's, like, at, at the same time, it really teaches you how to shut those things out because people aren't very nice. No. Uh, so, Does it, like, doesn't, like, motivate you more? Like, you hear – Because, like, if the crowd, like, is against me, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to, like, show these idiots. <laughs> But, I mean, that could just be my contrarian nature. So, like. Um, I, I don't know. I, I try not to, to hear it because if I hear them say something against me, I mean, there's some stuff you can't ignore. Like, if they're chanting the other guy's name, then how am I supposed to block that out, you know? Yeah. But I don't, I can't focus too much on that because i i'm there to fight the other person i'm not there to fight the crowd are they you know? are they just straight up insulting you like on the side like that feels uh, that, that, like only, that, that only happened like two or three times and it was my mustache and i'm like hey, <laughs> grow up you know <laughs> but um I mean, at least at least uh, Mohab couldn't understand Portuguese because in Brazil, I'm sure the crowd was probably going to try and insult him. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> I mean, in Paris, next time, yeah, next time you're in Paris, don't have a mustache, otherwise you might actually hear the insult. Yeah. I, had, I had a fun look in Brazil, and I uh, I managed to win my first fight, and then uh, it was yeah, it was when they took the pictures and I saw it the next day. I was like, who the hell is that guy? <laughs> 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 and what were you saying, Kyle? For the crowd. Yeah, so it's, so basically for me when I fight, it's like I don't hear anything. It's kind of weird because like you would think you would hear like you would hear all the like the whole crowd, but for me it's it's really don't like I really don't. So in Canada when I fought um Etienne, I didn't hear anything. Or even in France like when I fought one of the favorites uh, Frank Tevit, I I couldn't hear anything until I got thrown. So that's when I heard like uh, oh crap I got thrown like those are crappy matches bro. <laughs> I, I get I get crappy match matchups, man. I, I had like yeah. gas in Brazil. Come on. Yeah, I no. I also try not to look at the crowd too, because like when Kai and I fight, everybody watches. Because who knows what's gonna happen? Somebody's gonna break or or lose or something like that. So like usually all eyes is. all eyes are on us, and we're really good friends. And they make some like really distracting faces <laughs> when I have it. Yeah, the refs well, hate us. I think for me, it's like, yeah, I learned to, like, block, like, block it all out, except, like, the only time I got affected by the crowd was in Montreal, of course, because I was like, oh, damn, people are actually cheering for me for once. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, but that, honestly, that stressed me out the most, because I was like, I'm home, like, I have to perform, blah, 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 
You can see his reaction after the same. That's why I have the most embarrassing reaction you're gonna see in judo ever. After I threw my throw, and I was like, "Hey, I, I saw when you beat Haga, you got pretty excited." Oh, the first time I was like, "Cause it's Haga, man!" And but then in my, in Paris, I beat him again, and I think that was like uh, such a cool thing because Nico Nikugel was sitting on my chair and Inoue was sitting for his chair. Ooh. So I was like, and Inoue was like, "It's, it's Inoue, man." <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I wanted to go up to be like I'm sorry or something, but yeah. I still remember when you beat uh, Fry in in Montreal. That was, yeah, that, was, that, was that was intense, man. <laughs> the whole yeah. crowd was going nuts. I need a new throw because I feel like this is too repetitive now. <laughs> I'm getting sent down. Like I swear I have better, I have cool stuff. That's why wants to go to the tournament. He's just like I need a new throw on this. Yeah, I need, a, I need to throw somebody again. Yeah, hey. I told you I had that problem. So whenever my guy, have you seen your Goshis? Like I literally like they're fucking. Oh. You have a nice one against uh, the Austrian guy, Clara. Oh yeah, but that's like not like that's like Scotty has his on like the like the good cameras and stuff. Yeah. Like I need I to like I need to get into like the metal rounds and then do a big throw so like I can have the multiple angles. Yeah. Like, that's the main like goal in life is to have like multiple angle highlights. <laughs> yeah. Hey Shadi, so when you broke. When you broke the top 10, like when you got into the top 10 in your weight class, how, like, did your mentality change going into tournaments? My or? judo changed too, honestly. Yeah, like everything changed. It changed when I was like, because I got fifth at Junior Words, and I think that was the worst tournament I ever fought in my life. I was like, and then after that, right after that, a month after, I go to Osaka and I medal. And then honestly, after that, after that tournament, I was like, I'm definitely in the top 10 mentally. But then when I actually broke into the top 10 and, like, the first time I realized and it hit me, it was, like, I was about to fight and I saw my name, like, number eight in the world fighting, like, Shadi on the house, you know, when they put the number. Yeah. And I was like, oh, damn, that's that's sick. And then I've been starting, I take a lot less risks now. And I feel like my judo IQ got better. So if we're doing golden score, I was like, oh, I'd rather get slammed, but I'll give it my all, take risks. But now... I was like, no, like, it's golden score. I have to be careful with what I'm doing. I have to be very ridiculous and smart about my attacks. So, but I still attack, like, during the normal round, I still attack like an idiot. That's why I get countered often. But at the same time, my judo is more, I stick to what I know during competitions, and then I'll try a little bit because he keeps asking me every two minutes, can I try and move on you? I so, do the opposite. That's yeah. why I, uh, yeah, I try to mess up sometimes. I try to go big, like go big or go home, and sometimes I have a good opportunity. I'm like, I'll take it, and the guy will just like counter me or something. So I think I need to play more safe. Yeah, I remember Shadi going into Golden Score in I think Zagreb in the finals, and yeah. maybe just sticking to the same couple of throws until you pull out yeah. the arm bar. <laughs> I mean, that was a nice arm bar. Honestly, like I didn't even mean to. He just like I tried to counter him. <laughs> And then I saw, like, his arm, he left it there. And I was like, are you sure? <laughs> I Honestly, I remember, like, you, you were the only people cheering for me then, too. Because yeah. I was like, yeah. I up on IGF, it was, like, 87 like, against me. And I was like, hey, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. How did I that feel, like, when one you're, one like, thing. going into a match and, like, you see the, like, you see the odds for your own match? And yeah. you're like, huh. Yeah. Yeah, and I fought him in uh, you know, the, the the New York uh, team tournament, and he slammed me on my neck. So I was like, "Damn, he already slammed me once in my time." And literally a week, two weeks before, I got second in Montreal. I was like, "Yes, that would have been my my third silver medal in like a year." And I was gonna be like, eh, "You know, imagine going to the finals three times and keep losing in the finals. That that would hurt your ego a little bit." Yeah, definitely. I mean, so. Okay, let me ask you guys a question. What's the most meaningful medal you guys got? Oh. <laughs> During your whole career. Why don't you answer that question first yourself? Honestly, <laughs> I think what made me think I could do judo seriously was winning Bremen. Like yeah. the Bremen trip. Bremen is uh, like a junior and cadet tournament. Did you win the cadet or junior one? So I did. I went for four years and I went to the finals four years in a row. But I got gold twice. I got gold in my first year, U18. 
I got silver U18, I got silver U21, and then my last year I got gold. And then I was like, I think that tournament, because there's 100 and like 100 athletes per division. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, so I have like seven, eight fights. And I was like, I think, even though like, of course, not everybody's going to be amazing during those seven, eight fights, but I was like young and I was like, damn, if I can win this, I can probably like, it kind of like fixed my mindset a little bit that I can be good at that sport, you know? Yeah, yeah. that competition's rough, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I've only gone to Bremen once. I got seventh there. Yeah, and I almost honestly, got you. that's probably after five, six fights, which is pretty good. There's a few matches, but I remember I had the Japanese guy first match. And I yeah. like I just like he I countered Azuchimata in like the first minute and I was like, Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. And then I like last a couple matches later. <laughs> yeah, if I if I had won my first match, I would have fought you, John. <laughs> I remember that. Did. That's pretty true. But I don't know, for medals like I think maybe my like European Open when I got bronze in Luxembourg was like because that was like the first time I like medaled at like yeah. a tournament with Olymp like with Olympic ranking points, and like yep. it's like the first time where like my judo sort of came together for once. So like that kind of gave me a lot more confidence when like I actually saw my judo make sense, yeah. and I was like, oh, there's some like because I like watched like some of the videos back, and I'm like, huh, like I'm not a complete idiot. <laughs> You just have your own, you literally, yeah, your own style. Like, you can, it's John Jane's style. Yeah. So, like, once I, like, kind of, like, got into that, like, I started winning more match. Like, I started doing a lot better, I think, after that. It's, like, more regularly. But yeah. I still, still yet to, like, string all of my wins together in, like, one tournament on a Grand Prix level. Yeah. I was close in Paris, but. That was. Eric Paris front was really good. Like, really, yeah. really good. And then, like, in Dusseldorf, like, I think, like, I had the momentum coming in from Paris and Dusseldorf to, like, do something after that, but yeah, my knee was broken and lockdown happened, so. I was drained after Paris. Like, drained, yeah. drained, so after Dusseldorf. I threw the guy, then I fall on my back, and he pins me again. Like, first fight, and I was like, Ugh. Yeah, that's not a good feeling. I think that was like my biggest face palm fight. I was like, damn it, you know, and you're like, I'm such an idiot. Moha, what's your favorite medal or memorable medal? Honestly, I think, uh, well, I'm debating between the Pan Am Games, but I think I would say the Bratislava one, the European one, because I, uh, I always wanted to medal in Europe. And when I did, and I had like, I think it was my longest competition. I had maybe, well, Vizier was my longest competition. I had more fights now, but like back then, it was two years ago, I think, that Bratislava. And uh, I had like seven fights and I beat, uh, and I beat the Georgian. I fought Becca. I, I beat a strong Egyptian guy. Like I, I had good fights. And, uh, and I also love the fact that I was an Eastern European because like, I always wanted to go to like Russia and medal there because I just love like those places and uh, and yeah so when I was able to uh, to go there in Europe and and medal there and and do like good fights I was I felt like I can really like do well in Grand Prix and and do do well in the future so that was like my first uh, big like motivation let's say where I can prove myself I can do like damage. That's really cool. So what, what's some of your, like, favorite trips that you've been on in, like, the last couple of years? Just, like, training or competition? Because I know for, for, like, all of us, and, like, other than Jesse, sorry, it was Papenbaugh where we were all there. Yeah. Papenbaugh was awesome. Yeah. Was awesome. I had a rough time there. <laughs> yeah. Had a rough time. I, I love my trip with Geronimo when we took the train. <laughs> We yeah, the that's one of my like, favorite trips. Yeah, uh, we had that. We had great experience for sure. Your was, foot open. Yeah, it was crazy. So uh, much and such little time. It was so spontaneous and unexpected too. Hey, want to take want to take the train <laughs> and just travel Europe? Let's do it. And we just like would stop every every country, do some juro. It was just crazy. It was fun. Which yeah, I'd say also Papandreou. Which countries? Papandreou, like. Pardon? 
Which countries did you stop through Moha then, Geronimo? We, we stopped, we stopped in Munich. Uh, we stopped uh, in, well, we were in uh, Holland. We stopped in Munich. We stopped, no, in we stopped somewhere else before Munich. We, I think we stopped in, didn't we stop in Vienna at night? And we stayed at the train yeah. station. In Vienna, we didn't go out in Vienna, did we? I think I think we went to Vienna and then to Munich, but it was like a short stop. We had to like run to the train and then get on and then go to okay, Munich. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't like go to the city in Vienna. Uh, we just yeah, yeah. And uh, we we were in Budapest when we took the train or or Holland. Budapest. And we ended up in Holland after. Yeah. At yeah. The end. yeah. We stayed, so we stayed at night in in Munich. Say that again. We stayed one night in Munich. And then we went where in Germany? Dusseldorf. Uh, no, no, no. We went from Munich, and then we went straight because we stayed one night, and then I, we woke up the next day. You felt sick, so I went to the muse to like one or two museums. I oh, came. Yeah, I was staying in the Airbnb. I came back for lunch, and then you felt better. So then we went, walked around, and then. Oh wait, we went back to the Airbnb, stayed another night, and then the next day we were supposed to leave at like late in the afternoon. So we went to the Eisenbach and That's exactly what I was thinking about. That makes sense now, yeah. It was longer than a day. Because I was debating if we did that in Budapest or Nova. All the memories are going uh, we went to the brewery, remember? Yeah, we did. That was fun. That was in Munich, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was really fun. Yeah, it was it was a good trip for sure. Then we were trying to go out at night. At the end, it was like a Thursday or Tuesday and everything was closed. And we were mm -hmm. like, what the hell? And in the US and Canada, every, everything is open to like super late and Europeans just like sleep too much, I guess. Yeah, I think Budapest was fun too. Yeah, Budapest was crazy. We took really good pictures. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, <laughs> That's important. Has the most likes so far. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a good trip. And Shadi, how do you like our trip to Japan? And like, how I many, love it. How many times have you been to Japan for training trips? Four times, I think. Yeah. Been. I think I like, weren't yeah. you been for training. Uh, Toka. Like honestly, I don't remember the name of the universities. But I went to. I went to. Well, Tokai, of course. Yeah. I went to like five universities, I think. Yeah, and one of them was like a police university, so that was intense. But Tokai, like Tokai, you can't. It's ridiculous. Like Moradachi put you in the middle. Get, oh, yeah, Tokai. Did, get, did he ever places not do that? I don't know. Pardon? Did he ever places not do that in Japan? I, yeah, I no, no, not not everybody does that. But oh, right. I don't know. I think in Tokai, in Tokai, you're like you're a foreigner. You're a foreigner. We have to like kick your ass. And I, was like, oh, I, damn, I okay. thought I was so cool because it's just like I don't have to go around asking for rounds. I just have to stand in the middle and like. Yeah. Or, like, after after like my week and like week and a bit there, then people like started realizing that my judo doesn't make a lot of sense. So they just <laughs> like I made a I made a couple friends where they're like they liked going with me. It was like a love hate relationship. Yeah. But like Baker did not want to go with me after the first time. Yeah, that was that was rough. Like you and him went to war. I remember that. Yeah. I mean, you went to war with Baker, and you went to war with with our physiotherapist Tiffany. That was Did funny. You? Yeah, that was really Wait, cool. what? <laughs> they were clashing yeah. heads the whole trip. It was what funny. They're just like, they're always like, arguing. Like, fight, explain no, no, they're just arguing. The whole time. Oh, okay. That's fine. Yeah. Who was arguing? You and Tiffany, our physio. I was never arguing with <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was talking like. about. <laughs> I was explaining why I was right. Uh huh. John was just explaining why he was right. Yeah. <laughs> she was right. Yeah. Actually, the cool thing in Tokai was the Azerbaijanis were there too. Yeah. Hugh George and um, or Lipo, Lipo was there and uh, Trika Shirley. Yeah. That's it. Was, Everybody, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. The, Azerbaij the Azerbaijan doctor and uh, Stephanie were getting along. Yeah. What is, what is everybody's favorite camp to attend, though? Bane. What? The, I, would say, I would say like the, well, sorry, I, I'm, I keep cutting you, keep going, you say first. Okay, I like um, <laughs> Cast of Hells, the one in Spain. Oh yeah, that one was really nice. That's a rough one. Mm -hmm. That's not rough, it's fun. I would love Wait, to do that. 
because they took they don't have it anymore. They have Alicante now, mm-hmm. which I went to and it was like pretty good, but it was nowhere near Castafels. Because Castafels had like literally everyone. Yeah. And then Papandale is, is also a really good one I like. Though when I did it, because it was good when you guys were there, but like I did it the year before and I was by myself. Yeah, that's right. And like mm-hmm. I've done a lot of training camps like by myself. And those really, those are tough, like yeah. kind of mentally, because you're just like, you go home, you go to your hotel and you just like sit in the, sit there and just like face the wall for like until the next training. Yeah, I did that. I did that in Ekaterinburg. The whole team literally left me. I was supposed to have Antoine and Arthur stay with me, but then they decided to leave. <laughs> so I was out by myself. Literally, I would like train and literally all Russians are insanely strong. So I was like, get beat up. Go back to my hotel, eat Burger King, and like be like cry, <laughs> almost cry, waiting for the next training. Go back to training, Burger King, and I was like, yeah, Burger King saved my life. That, that, that. How was that? How was how was the training camp there? Like, who stayed for that? Was it just yeah, the Russians? Literally, some Russians are wearing like blue belts, and I'm like, okay, I'm like I just finished competition, I'm exhausted. I'll go like I go, I'll go like with, with a blue belt, and then I fight them. And they're really harder and stronger than people I fought in the competition. And they're like, damn, you know. It's those Russian blue belts. <laughs> like they're all ridiculously, like it's ridiculously sweet. Ridiculous. Russian blue belts and Russian orange belts. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Mohab? What's your favorite camp I to think, attend? I think my favorite is, uh, was the one at uh, Minsk, in Belarus. This one was really good. Like the Turkish team was there, the, the Azerbaijan. And we would just like, it wasn't like a big camp. It was just like a couple teams, but like, you know, like the fights were really intense because it's like kind of the same people, but like really strong. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know, it was really, uh, it was really intense for me. I, I enjoyed it. And I liked the center and stuff. There was like this lake or river or pond or whatever, and we would jump <laughs> after every training. And it was really warm, the water. So I, I liked that. Yeah, yeah, so we enjoyed it. Liam. How's life? It's great, you know, same old. Training with Kyle, my sister, that's about it. School. Is, Canada, is Canada accepting any foreigners to come train? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they're really strict right now. Like, where we train the Olympic Center, they're super strict. Like, every morning we have to do a whole um, quiz or like, no, questionnaire. Quiz or question. Yeah, questionnaire about, like, symptoms blah blah and then like we have to wear a mask the whole time and have a box we have to change our whole outfits if we're gonna go to the gym and change our shoes yeah we don't wear a mask when we're training but we have to wear it like if, like all around yeah. even when we're like right literally the finish you finish your set of bench press then you have to put your mask on and then if somebody's spotting you you need to have your mask on and one time i was like choking i was dying and, <laughs> was there. and i was like i live with that guy like we're like like cuddling like you see and they don't care <laughs> They're like, nope, rules are rules. I was like, yeah, but like they have to make sense. Well, you know, we don't argue. We just do what we got to do so we can train. Yeah, yeah. And... If we so, all get together to train, would you guys come? What's that? If we all get together to train, would you guys come? I'm down. I would love that. That would be amazing. Would honestly. Okay. The, te- the Texas training camp. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all go to Cal and Liam's uh, garage and have a... Yeah, there we go. ...rent door every night. <laughs> We can, all, we can all deadlift in uh, Kyle's garage. Gotta get it's some okay. more plates. We got some more plates, yeah. I'm not a fan of deadlifting. But. but so you guys, so like things are pretty strict over there in Canada. So you, like every day you have to show up, you have to fill in the questionnaire. Yeah. And you, do you have to well, do that twice a day or and like? Do yeah. Like, every, there has to be a four hour. Like every four hour, you have to fill a questionnaire. Every four yeah. hours. So basically, no, because we, we train at like 9.30 for the gym and like cardio and tech, blah, blah, blah. And then the other training, now we have like different times because there's so many groups split into four. So it's either you train at four or at six, but there's more than four hour gap in between. So you have to do a questionnaire again. And do you guys get tested at all or, or do they check bro. your temperature at least? Bro. Bro. <laughs> we got tested. My mom got tested four times in the last like month and a half. Yes. Yeah, and like nice. I'm scarred. Like like and like I get the nurses that like like sh- like go aggressively up your nose and <laughs> yeah, it's not a good feeling. 
How does that affect your training if you're getting like do you have to like stay at home then all the time and just like just no. go from home to the center? Not really. Like at the same time, so, like I'm so tired that I'm probably gonna stay home most of the time. But no, like uh, I can still live my life. I just have to be careful. I can't just go and like party or go clubbing and like you know. I have to be careful. But if I get tested, we have to wait to be home until we get the result, of course. So, that's pretty much it. Literally been been my life, Mohab and his life for the past what four months. Mohab, Mohab, do you want to talk about your life? <laughs> what, what technique? What technique were you thinking of like bringing up? Well, I wanted to surprise you next time I ever do it, but I guess I'll, I'll share it. And I, yeah, yeah, that's going to be um, a good several months from now. And by then, it's going to have oh, changed several oh, times. I'll tell you so you can prepare yourself mentally. It's going to be a, a mix of a suplex. With, uh, like from the front or from the back? From the side. With a, oh. with a half <laughs> orchie hook. And then like there's a, there's a touch in it, but this one you'll have to feel it yourself after. So, so you're saying you're coming in from an... You're coming in from the side. You're doing an ochi. Yeah. It's usually a technique done from the front. I'm, I'm hooking an ochi from the sides. So, like, you know, like that hook jump. And then I'm taking you with a suplex. Do you think he's going to manhandle you, is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Are you doing the spiral thing with your leg? Well, I'm trying, but I can't do it yet. I don't think that's legal. No, no, you mean like the spiral, like where, like, I thought you mean you like, the, it, you know, no, 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 not around, because this is, yeah, this is a illegal. illegal move, but no, it's illegal if you, if I take you backward or like, if I just throw you with it, but if, if I just hook and then I go like inside and I just flip you, I think it's fine. Like nothing uh, says I can't spin you midair as I throw <laughs> you. <laughs> I don't know, Shadi, tell us, tell us what it feels like. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. No. Try he can't throw me, so until then, I didn't feel it. Right. <laughs> I, well, he's, he's right about this, but only in his dreams. In his dreams, I can't throw him, but when we fight, yeah. John, on, on your next, on your next uh, you, the one you do, we'll just let it, I'll film it, the Zoom call on the map, and me and Mom are going to fight, and you can, like, referee it. Yeah, deal. Yeah, actually, oh, that would be pretty cool that. to have him fight on the map. Uh, yeah. I'll destroy him for you guys. <laughs> I'll forget his my brother. <laughs> Wait, yeah. so, so Shadi and uh, Mohab, so you guys said when quarantine first started, you guys didn't really do much. Uh, did you guys use that time to let injuries heal or work on your weaknesses? Or was it just like, do whatever you can? For me, honestly, I worked a lot about my mental, like mental health and stuff. I, I became better into, like I, I became, I was already interested in psychology and stuff like that. But I used that time to work on like, like, everybody did i feel like there's i worked on myself i i started enjoying my time alone i like more than before i i started going on runs on hikes like i feel like i got back in touch with my uh spiritual side i guess or like it was just like you know it was interesting but also like i had a lot of downs too because you know like you're not used to stuff like that so sometimes you just like start like like feeling like that void that you usually like you feel it was training with judo with that busy life but then it's like taken away from you and you're just like left alone with your thoughts and stuff. And especially in the beginning when you weren't even allowed to see your friends or like it was all like Zoom calls, it got to me for sure mentally. So I, I think that's uh, where I put most of my energy. It was all mental. So he's the deep brother. Yourself. Yeah, he's the very deep emotional brother, as you can tell. <laughs> no, for me, I think it was, honestly, it's, I didn't realize it, but I needed a break from traveling. I was exhausted. And I feel like also at the end, I was so burnt out that every competition, I'd be like, okay, I made the quarterfinals. Then, like, I'd be so burnt out, I'd lose, right? I, like, and I needed that break to, to heal up and, like, recover. Like, after Paris, after the, the, the – I got fifth. I lost for bronze. Or I got destroyed in the bronze, sadly. I was so burnt. I was like, like, Dusseldorf wasn't in, in my head. I went to Dusseldorf. I was like, it is what it is. And that's why I lost. But I don't know. I think it was, like, super healthy – to take a break to like refresh your mind and your body off of all of like the stress of tra traveling and stuff. I counted like, cause Judo Canada makes you have like the cheaper routes to travel. So we take like four flights to get to somewhere. We took 47 flights in 2019, which is. Yeah, you guys really uh, like to cut 
cut costs as all as much as possible. Yeah, like honestly, I've been like I'm down to pay like a hundred dollars or like however much to like show, like make that shorter, right? Because it takes a toll on you. Well, yeah, why, yeah. I think Corona, COVID, like helped me step back, and I needed to step back because otherwise, <laughs> like I was so burnt out, and I think a lot of people were burnt out from just competing, competing, competing. And yeah, like you don't do your best after like eight competitions in like after, like every month, you know. So do you think that like I mean this goes for both of you for Shadi obviously like the Olympics and for Mohab like qualifying, but do you think this break is gonna help you do better in the Olympics now that like they're postponed and Mohab? Do you think it's gonna help you like qualify? Yeah. Like, it's gonna be a sh- it's gonna be an easier way for like you to be like mentally prepared for what's coming for sure honestly for me i think it's a blessing that it got postponed because you know like i was uh, i was more like focused on the quota because like i wasn't like before olympics i wasn't qualified i just had the quota it was between me and zach like one of us would go because of the quota so i was like uh, top 40 but like to be qualified you need to be in the top, top 30 so for shari it was bad right because he was top uh, six and then uh, sorry my bad i just dropped something yeah, and um, he was in the top six, right? So he was he would had a really good pool and everything. But for me, I wasn't technically even qualified. I would just go because of the quota. But now I can actually prove myself. I can make it. Hopefully, if I'm able to win something big, I can even make it like in the top ten. You never know. Like it takes more time. I, I I'm not aiming for that yet. I'm just aiming to be top like 25 at first. But I feel like uh, like for example, what like uh, Bekawi did, like uh, Lasha, like this guy was like top 60, not even went to one tournament, got first a world master, unexpected, and he's in the top 10 now, you know? So I feel like it's doable, but like I'm, I'm aiming first to like get like a Grand Prix medal. And then, you know, like in Montreal, I was really close. I ended up fifth, but like, I think if I, if I had the right mindset, I would have hundred percent got that medal. So I'm just aiming for that. And I just, I just hope the tournaments are, are on soon. So I can do it. As a, the lockdown, do you think it's improved your mindset? Um, uh, for sure it did. Like I, I grew so much from it, but, uh, it took a lot of time and work for sure. Like it, it, like I had like a lot of, like I said, like a lot of ups and down, a lot of ups and down, but then now I feel like I'm, I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a good place, but, uh, I just want to see how it will, uh, how I'll react in the tournament. Right. Cause I haven't felt that, that vibe in a while. Well, for me, Honestly, I was like, I was very disappointed because I don't know. I think I had everything like aligned perfectly for me to perform. It was like, you because what top eight, so I was seated. So I was like, I was ranked six, so I was seated. And then with my seating, I would have had a fight with somebody I beat before. So I was like, I'd make the quarters, I'd beat that guy in the quarters. Everything would be aligned perfectly. Like, I wouldn't have had Wolf who's giving me trouble or Adam who's giving me trouble. I would have had somebody, like, I beat before. So I was like, oh, that's perfect. And then it didn't happen. I was like, oh, damn, instead of sulking, which I did for a little bit, let's be honest. And I was like, I'll just try to be a beast in the gym or try to be a beast in the gym and just get a lot stronger, a lot better. And hopefully, well, that's the thing. Of course, I'm stressed. I'm like, I don't want to, like, fall off my top eight seating. But I think I believe in myself enough to be like, I can actually climb up the rankings, then go down the rankings, and we'll see. Yeah, like uh, again, only time will tell, right? Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna be like, oh, the Olympics are happening 100%, because I don't want to have like high, high hopes and then like you know get crushed if it doesn't happen. But I don't want to be like, oh, they're canceled. So I'm just, I'm going with the flow, with that in that department, you know? Yeah. How's your lifts going in the gym? Oh man, Three what kind of weights? Are you, kind of weights are you? <laughs> uh, like me and Mohab are pretty similar, and and the, at the gym, sadly, even though he's ninety and I'm hundred, uh, yeah, I think bench one forty, uh, deadlifts. I want to say like this. Well, I'm I'm yes. I'm I'm weaker when it comes to legs because my my knee injury. I still have to figure that shit out, yeah. but uh, when yeah. it comes to squad, like I like I do I, 170, 165. Yeah. You've had all of lockdown to figure out your knee, haven't you? No, because <laughs> like I'm so, like I have the Osgood flatter, right? So that's that's tough. Yeah, what? 
it's, it's an injury it comes with time like so it's the bone i can okay i can't show it on camera right now because i'm anyways so uh yeah it's like a bone that forms on your knee and then uh it's either it goes away with time but for me like it became chronic so i need like if i do the surgery they literally like shave the bone off like they cut it off but then it's like they take off the tendon and they put it back and it takes like a 10 month recovery at least so i didn't know when the i thought the quarantine will be like three months four months max right and olympics are coming up and so i didn't want to take the risk so i'll probably do it after uh the, the summer of 21 but uh yeah i don't think uh i want to risk it now if i do it like this month then i'm out for till till next year like late next year john you usually yeah. ask a bladder is a thing that uh, kids having puberty <laughs> oh, when they're growing yeah so i i had it when i was like 14 15 i had it for like three years mm-hmm. so i i feel your pain more yeah but mine again like the thing is like the, yours doesn't hurt anymore right no it's gone it's it, it, it doesn't turn chronic that's, that's most people it happens like that it, it it builds up during when you're like a teenager but yeah. then you like once it starts hurting you watch out but for me i was not the smartest kid so i kept training i kept training i kept making it work and now like I was like 20, it was still like hurting and like I went to see doctors and they're like, yeah, it's supposed to go away in a year max when you stop growing. Now I'm like almost 25 and it, and it gets worse every year. <laughs> if you look at his knee, it's literally like a tennis ball. It's dangling out of his it's knee. It's like huge. It's not even like, because it starts slow, uh, slow, it starts small. Like people like gets like a bump. But for me, it's like another it's knee. It's literally a tennis ball. Yeah. Yeah. You're just a late bloomer, Moham. Huh? Late You're bloomer. a late bloomer. Yeah, I know. I'm still going. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm still growing, but muscle-wise. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> injured or everybody's awesome. done? Nobody's injured, everybody's 100%. I broke yeah, my, my, knee, my knee comes and goes. Wait, what? My knee comes and goes. Yeah. It's like, so, depending on how much rehab I do, like, like, the more, like, rehab I do on it, the better it feels. The less I do it, the worse it feels. How about you do more rehab then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel it's right. like one of those ones where like, if I do more hamstring curls, then it feels better. Yeah. But I just kind of do that like every so often when it like kind of hurts a little bit. But Yeah. But for, I think for like judo athletes or any fighting sport, uh, you just have some, some that won't go away. Like for example, like I hurt my elbow in Zagreb last year, 2019. And then quarantine happened, and I was like, oh, perfect time to heal. Literally, do five of trachomies, and, like, my elbow hurts again. I feel like some injuries just won't go away, and they won't. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, guys, just I got to head out. All right. All right. Take care. It was good to see you guys. We'll stay in touch. Yes, sir. Easy. Everybody else, I'll see you guys next week. All right. Yeah, man. Cheers. Yep. Yo. Yo's. So, Shadi, how's your deadlift going? Uh, it's going slowly but surely. I don't know. I feel like with I've my back hurts often, so I don't try to do PRs. Yeah, but I don't know. I do pretty decent weight, like three plates and a bit. Just like you know, I think that's my that's my like comfortable zone for my back. Well, you're kind of you're kind of tall, so like maybe yeah. it'd be better to do like from a rack. Yeah, or I do like more. sumo sometimes too. Yeah, for taller it's people, the, deadlifts are harder. Yeah, it's the, it's the easiest way to do sumo. I think yeah. It's, yeah. Unless you're six eight and four pounds. And, but. Yeah, but I've seen your your workout routine, Johnny boy. And it's just looking intense. It's yeah, it's getting up there. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, because Tokyo, like I said, because Tokyo is canceled. That means I'm probably going to, like, after my squat phase, I might go back to deadlifts just because yeah. I just like deadlifting. As, just as long as you stay 90, you don't go 100, we're, mm. we're, we're good. Don't worry. I, I kind of like being taller than everyone at 90. Yeah, yeah John, don't do that. That's <laughs> don't do that. No, I just don't want to have that. Like, you seem like a hard fight, bro. I don't want to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, when we did Randorian, like, when in Papandau, you, like, kind of, like, like, threw me around a bit no it I was, didn't i just i just pistol gripped the crap out of your sleeve and oh like, that's no. what happened i didn't realize i'm not letting go of that 
everybody does pistol grips nowadays so i'm like yeah i really hate that i'm fighting somebody and i'm like if you're gonna do it i'm just gonna do it back i just i'll be smart and hide it you and you'll get a sheet off you got the spanish guy the professional at it when i fought him in brazil i was like bro let go of that stuff and he was like and i was like looking at it i was like bro like what and it just doesn't that you can break it because it's like he puts like his finger in a weird way i don't, I don't even know anymore. oh he does that cheat grip you just have to be smart like, yeah. honestly like I was like, oh, I'm going to play, like, I'm going to fight, like, tradition, like, clean. Well, of course, clean. Judo is a clean sport, but I don't know. I'm like, people are going to pistol grip me. I'm just going to pistol grip you back. And you just have to learn how to hide it properly a little bit. Like, I gave a guy two shiros in, like, 30 seconds because they would pistol grip me. And I'd pistol grip them, and it would be stuck like this, but I'd hide mine. And then, they'd, like, you get two shiros. And I think... I think Eliadis, like, he did that pistol grip and he would, um, I think he said that, like, he would specifically move around so that the referee wouldn't be able to, like, see yeah. from the, like, see the pistol grip from a certain angle. Yeah, yeah that's smart. Now, because now there's only one ref, right? Like, it's been like that for a while, but, like, yeah, it was harder because, like, it was all around you. But, like, yeah, but, like, the, um, I don't think the, uh, the side judges could have been like Carl Maté to give someone a, like a penalty for pistol gripping. Uh, and they can't see that well. Like it's more like the, when it comes to pistol grip and cameras, it's not you can't see it as well. You need to be like literally like sitting on the mat or like like yeah. right next to it to see like the pistol because pistol can be like literally like just like a tiny part of your finger in it counts as pistol. You know what I mean? Like it can be really yeah. tricky. So it, they rather not give a shield than give you a fake shield for like holding normally. That's why yeah. they. You just don't give sometimes. Yeah. All right, so I think we've been on here for about an hour now. So I think that's probably enough for today. Perfect. So anyway, I'll see, see you guys next time. And uh, like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. And, and peace.